Hi guys! Madang araw po sa inyong lahat. This is me, Sean, from Keep It Up With Sean. And today, this is the last video of this year's lecture series in soil science as you prepare for the board examination. Pasensya na, I tried my best to make a lot of videos, pero hindi ko talaga siya nahabol. So, this will be my last and I hope uh, makahabol to at makatulong to sa inyo for your preparation for the board exam. So, in this video, we are going to talk about soil fertility and plant nutrition at the same time, uh, how to calculate fertilizer recommendations. So, uh, this is just the basic information. Sana next year, I promise to prepare a more intensive uh, video presentation about uh, soil fertility and uh, sana ma-improve ko pa rin yung mga iba kong presentation. So, I hope you can learn something from this and... Let me know kung meron kayo mga clarification and I will try my best to correct and to explain it to you as easy as possible. So, I wish you all the best and if you are new to my channel, please click the subscribe button and it will help me a lot. Thank you very much and uh, I wish you all the best for your exam. Bye! Welcome guys again for this last video for this lecture series. Uh, today, we are going to talk about soil fertility and plant nutrition. It is a very, very important topic as we understand soil fertility, which has a very big impact in, in agriculture, especially in crop production. But first, we need to understand plant nutrition. Plants used in organic minerals for nutrition, whether grown in the field or in a container, kahit yung mga pasok -paso natin, they need nutrients from the soil. Complex interactions involving weathering of rock minerals, the carrying of organic matter, animals, and microbes take place to form inorganic minerals in the soils, and at the same time, they also manufacture the, ma the organic matter in the soil. Roots absorb mineral nutrients as ions in soil water. That's why we first discuss about soil water and then ion exchange because those two uh, properties of the soil, chemical and the physical properties, are very important in the uptake of the nutrients from the soil. There are many factors influencing the nutrient uptake for plants. Ions can be readily available to roots or could be tied up by other elements or the soil itself. Kaya kahit na fertile yung lupa natin, if some of those elements are, need, are not in their available form, hindi pa rin siya magagamit ng tanim. Or even if the soil is fertile, but then very dry yung lupa, those nutrients, those ions will not be absorbed by the plants because of ions that works with the water. They are absorbed through water by the plants, so hindi pa rin siya magagamit ng mga tanim. Soils that has too high in a pH, like alkaline soil, or too low, which is acidic soil, makes minerals unavailable to plants. Plants need 16 essential elements for their growth and development, and 9 of, of these elements are termed as macronutrients. Macronutrients meaning macro, madami, malaki. They are major nutrients needed by plants in large quantities and amounts. And these include carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. So these nutrients are called macronutrients, meaning kailangan siya ng tanim in maraming quantities. But then there are also other nutrients that are needed by the plants but not not in the large quantities. And these are referred to as micronutrients. So there are seven of them, and that includes boron, zinc, manganese, copper, iron, chlorine, and molybdenum. These are the 16 essential elements needed by the plants. Most of the essential nutrients, except nitrogen, are derived from minerals. That's why we discuss about, in the beginning, we discuss about rocks and minerals, weathering, because through those processes, those minerals coming from rocks are weathered and now are available 
as plant nutrients in the soil. So most of those elements are derived from minerals except nitrogen. Three of the elements are derived from air and water. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are mostly derived from air and water. But then what about nitrogen? Nitrogen is mostly present in, in the air. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen are derived from air and water, and most of the minerals are derived from the minerals except the nitrogen, which is mostly coming from the air, from the atmosphere. Elements exist in the soil in two combinations with organic compounds, in the complex structure of minerals or in salts in the soil solution. When organic and inorganic compounds decompose and the solutes dissociate into their component ions, the nutrient becomes available for absorption by plants or adsorbed on colloid surfaces. So it has to be available in available forms. Otherwise, they will not be taken up by plants or they will not be adsorbed on the soil colloids. It is the ionic form of nutrients that are available for plant use, not the element, but it has to be in ionic form. And these essential elements was proposed by Arnon and Stout in 1939. They studied about the, what are the qualities or the requirements for an essential element to be considered essential. And there are three criteria for an element to be considered essential. Number one is a plant must be unable to complete its life cycle in the absence of the mineral element. So those 16 essential elements are selected based on these three criteria. The second criteria is the function of the element must not be replaceable by another mineral element. Like for example, oxygen. Oxygen is considered essential element. If there is no oxygen, you cannot replace oxygen with any other element. The number three criteria is that the element must be directly involved in plant metabolism. So these are the three criteria um, for an element to be considered essential. These criteria were set by plant nutritionists. Hindi lang siya basta-basang klinasify na ganyan. They were and were arrived through a series of experiments in culture solutions as well as field studies. So it took them time for them to be able to to determine what are the essential elements needed by the plants. Cobalt, vanadium, sodium, and silicon were added as they are essential for specific plants and they are referred to as beneficial elements but not essential elements. So remember here in the macronutrients and the micronutrients, sodium, which is one of the basic cations, is not considered as essential elements, but it is a beneficial element because it is needed for some specific plants. Beneficial elements. So beneficial elements are elements that can compensate for toxic effects of other elements or may replace mineral nutrients in some other less specific function, such as the maintenance of osmotic pressure. The omission of beneficial nutrients in commercial production could mean that Plants are not being grown to their optimal genetic potential, but are merely produced at a subsistence level. So kahit mawala yung beneficial na element na yan, mabubuhay pa rin yung tanim. Yun nga lang, hindi na yung optimum growth ang yung kanyang maibigay. The plant can still live, but only at a subsistence level. However, if we supply the beneficial element, then the plant can grow to its optimum potential. Cobalt is essential for nitrogen fixation in legumes and it may also inhibit ethylene formation and extend the life of cut roses. Silicon, which is very abundant in the soil, is deposited in cell walls and has been found to improve heat and drought tolerance and increase resistance to insects and fungal infections. Silicon acting as a beneficial element can help compensate for toxic levels of manganese, iron, phosphorus, and aluminum 
as well as zinc deficiency. So for you to be able to remember these 16 essential elements, there was this paper hanging in a cafe, an advertisement. It says, C.B. Hopkins Cafe Company closed Monday morning and night. See you soon, the MG, the manager. I hope you can recognize the 16 essential elements. So we have here uh, the blue letters. So help me find them, identify them. So we have carbon, boron, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, potassium, nitrogen, sulfur. And then we have calcium, iron, and cobalt. Closed is chlorine. Monday is manganese. Morning is molybdenum. And night is nickel. And then CU, CU is at copper. Soon is zinc. The manager, MG, magnesium. So through this, uh, I hope you can identify the 16 essential elements and you can remember them. These are the nutrients um, needed by the plants, their form of uptake and functions. So we have here the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and calcium. Note that nitrogen is taken up by the plant as nitrate or ammonium. And these are very important component of important cell compounds ranging from proteins to chlorophyll and genes. Phosphorus, on the other hand, are in phosphoric acid and they are constituents of genes, has a central role in plant energy transfer and protein metabolism. And we have the potassium, potassium ions. They are help, helps in, in osmotic and ionic regulation, important for many enzyme functions in carbohydrates and protein metabolism. And calcium, on the other hand, is also taken up as an ion, and it is involved in cell division and plays a major role in the maintenance of membrane integrity. Magnesium, these are all uh, in their form, so as ions, so most of them are in ions. And they are, magnesium on the other hand is a component of chlorophyll and a factor in many enzymatic reactions. Sulfur as sulfate, constituents of protein, amino acids, and vitamins necessary for production of plant oils. Iron, they are component of many enzymes, including cytochromes, respiratory enzyme, and the ferredoxins involved in functions such as nitrogen fixation and photosynthesis. Zinc is necessary for the correct functioning of a range of important enzyme systems for the synthesis of nucleic acids and the metabolism of auxin, which is a plant hormone. The manganese is composed of component of several enzymes, including those involved in photosynthesis. Copper is a component of a range of important enzymes necessary for proper photosynthesis and involved in grain production. Molybdenum is required for normal assimilation of nitrogen in plants for the reduction of nitrate to ammonium. And this is also required for nitrogen fixation and for chlorophyll. Chlorine is essential for photosynthesis and for osmoregulations of plant growing on saline soils. Nickel is constituent of the enzyme urease in legumes. So it has a lot of functions. So without those elements, plants cannot complete its plant cycle. So that's why they are considered as essential elements. So there are 16 of them, and those are their form and those are their functions. Now, are fertile soils productive soils? What do you think? Pag mataba ba ang yung lupa, uh, does it mean productive yung lupa? So, in this concept, we are going to understand uh, the soil fertility versus soil productivity. But first, we need to understand what is soil fertility? Soil fertility refers to the inherent capacity of the soil to provide nutrient to plants in the right amount and correct proportion. So yun yung main keyword. To provide nutrients to plants in the right amount and correct proportion. 
right amount, meaning hindi siya ganun ka dami or hindi siya ganun ka baba, and in correct proportion. Soil productivity, on the other hand, is the ability of the soil to support or produce desired quantity of plant yield. Yield, so meaning to say, yield, ani. So dapat yung lupa natin is nakapag-produce tayo at meron tayong nakuhang ani from that soil. So yun yung productivity. Productive meaning is Meron kang income, meron kang yield na nakuha from your soil. Fertile soils, productive soils. Note that the soil productivity is measured in terms of yield and it encompasses soil fertility. Soil fertility is only one factor that makes a soil productive. There are also other productive fa productivity factors which affect and influence the yield of your soil. It includes moisture, aeration, occurrence of pests and diseases, management practices, and others. So kahit gaano pa kataba at kafertil ang inyong lupa, kung dry naman yung soil mo, masyadong mainit or masyadong inatake ka ngayon ng pest and fungal diseases and pests and diseases, ganun, wala kang harvest, so that soil is still not productive. So, fertility is just one component of productivity. So, are fertile soils productive soils? What do you think? A productive soil is necessarily fertile, but a fertile soil is not necessarily productive. Even if the soil has adequate supply of nutrients, it cannot produce optimum yield if water is limiting or other factors are limiting like in siya ng pests and diseases or in siya ng drought. So those are factors affecting the productivity of your soil. So I hope it's clear to you. If the nutrients are adequate but not in proper proportions relative to other nutrients, Plants will suffer from a variety of disorders because it will have a antagonistic and synergistic effect. Pag masyadong marami yung nutrients na isa, it will have an influence on the other nutrients, making them less available or more available. So the excess amount of a nutrient could have an antagonistic effect on other nutrients, making them unavailable to the plant. But then, not all deficiencies are caused by a lack of of nutrients. Some of them, like for example, low calcium levels or because of a high level of nitrates. Because nitrates push calcium away and can block adsorption. The antagonistic action of nutrients shows toxicities of a certain elements or can kick out or and displace another element. So hindi ibig sabihin na uh, kulang tayo ng calcium because siguro napasobra yung nitrogen mo which causes or kick out calcium in the soil solution. So, meron siyang competition. So, meron sa ngayon antagonistic at saka synergistic effect. Understanding nutrient antagonism makes diagnosing deficiencies and toxicities more difficult but more accurate. Most nutrients usually work together, so they work hand-in-hand -hand together, synergism, but not always. Too much phosphorus, for example, increase the plant's nitrogen uptake and balancing the nutrition. And at the same time, it also limits the uptake of zinc, iron, and copper. Thus, the optimum nutrition is achieved by balancing the nutrients in the medium. Not too much of one nutrient or not too low of one nutrient. It has to be balanced. These are the list of elements that cause interactions with other elements if the ratio is not in synergy. So we have here nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. For nitrogen, excess nitrogen causes the ratios to shift, making calcium and potassium unavailable. For phosphorus, except phosphorus, can lock out important microelements like zinc, copper, and iron, and excess of potassium will affect the plant's consumption 
of calcium and magnesium. Then we also have calcium. Excess calcium reduced the availability to nitrogen, magnesium, boron, and phosphorus. Magnesium, excess magnesium locks out calcium and potassium and leads to micronutrients lockout. Excess iron completely restricts phosphorus and completely locks out manganese. And excess manganese, which is usually rare, locks out calcium, copper, zinc, and iron. Copper, on the other hand, uh, if it's in excessive quantities, antagonizes iron, manganese, and phosphorus. Excess zinc antagonizes phosphorus, copper, and iron. Excess molybdenum causes severe copper deficiency, further locking out iron and zinc. Excess sodium can create loss of problems limiting potassium. Excess boron locks out. Excess boron locks out calcium and potassium. Excess sulfur, which is usually rare, limits nitrogen, magnesium, phosphorus, and calcium. So you see, too much of something is not good. So remember that, guys. If if the nutrients are in too much quantities, in large will have an influence on the other nutrients. So the ratio should just be balanced. And it's so difficult to get that balance. Where do we get those nutrient elements? Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, we know that we derive them from mostly from air and water. And the rest of the nutrients are derived mostly from minerals except nitrogen. Essential elements are derived from organic matter, minerals, air, and water. The carbon and the hydrogen are derived mainly from carbon dioxide and water and oxygen in the air. The air partly supplies nitrogen by the process of symbiotic air fixation. And for other plants, the major source of nitrogen is organic matter, which contains 5 to 6% nitrogen. Minerals do not contain nitrogen, and nitrogen in the air is 78% is made use of by the plants when lightnings convert it to nitrate, which is brought down during rain. So now nitrogen is coming from the atmosphere, and they are use utilized up by the plant during lightning, kidlat, kidlat ba, tawag niyan, lightning, which convert it to nitrate and then brought out in the soil during rains. What about phosphorus? Phosphorus is released from soil organic matter which contains about 1% phosphorus and they are bound in phytin, phospholipids, and nucleic acids and the major inorganic sources in the soil are acid-soluble phosphorus, calcium phosphate, aluminum phosphate, iron phosphate, and reductant-soluble phosphorus. Then we also have sulfur. They are contained in organic matter at a concentration of 1%. They are present in many minerals, particularly gypsum, and metal sulfides such as pyrites. Remember, remember guys, gypsum is not a lime product. Gypsum is used to reduce the pH of the soil. If your soil is alkaline or higher has higher pH, we use gypsum to bring the pH down. So it makes your soil a little bit uh, acidic. So pinapababa niyo yung pH ng lupa. It is released into the soil in the form of hydrogen sulfide, iron sulfide, and sulfate. Other nutrient elements are present in organic matter at very low concentration, and the majority of the element comes from the weathering of minerals. Calcium is found in hornblende, plagioclase, dolomite, and calcite. Dolomite and calcite are all liming, lime materials which are in carbonate form, and magnesium occurs in hornblende, dolomite, and biotite. Dolomite also contains both calcium and magnesium. That's why in the beginning of our lecture, we discussed about the rocks and minerals, the igneous rocks, because those are where our minerals are coming from. Potassium is contained in potassium feldspars, like micas and elites. We discussed it during the 
in the clay colloids. Then we have the micronutrients, which are derived from various minerals, and they usually do not become limiting to plants since plants need them in only very small amounts. Micro. Maliit. Konti lang yung kailangan ng plants. Iron is among the most abundant micronutrients being supplied from limonite, hematite, gothite, and others. Micronutrients present at large amounts or in excess of plant requirements become toxic, which is not good to plants. Chlorine is also contained in minerals, but it may be supplied from salt sprays from irrigation water. And we have the nutrient availability. It is a function of its chemical form and position relative to actively absorbing roots. So the roots is very, very important. The roots should be healthy at the same time. Nutrients are in chemically available form if they are present either as soluble or exchangeable ions. It has to be soluble or exchangeable ions. They are in positionally available when they are in close or direct contact with the root surface and other forms that are not insoluble or exchange ions are considered unavailable. That's why there has to be water, guys, because if you applied fertilizer, if then there is no water, those elements present in the fertilizer will not be available now to roots. Fertile soils are capable not only of quickly supplying large amount of available nutrients, but can also meet a sustained demand over comparatively long periods. Infertile soils can meet a large immediate demand for nutrients only if they are fertilized. So, pag nag-aabono ka sa mga infertile na yuta, na lupa, you can always get the direct effect of that. Nutrient availability, availability is affected by different factors. Number one is the concentration, which is intensity factor. The greater the concentration of nutrient in the soil solution, the greater the availability of nutrients. So it's logical, guys. Diba? Pag marami, syempre, dahil maraming supply, marami kang maibibigay dun sa plants. And this is affected by pH and oxidation, especially with the redox potential. The second is capacity factor. This is ability of the soil to replenish the nutrients in the soil solution. And this is affected by the kind of nutrient elements. Most nutrients are supplied to plants by the process of diffusion, particularly phosphorus and potassium. And only a small proportion is absorbed by plants through mass flow, especially when absorption and transpiration of water by plant is low. The nutrient contact by contact exchange is believed to be small. So we have different theories. Carrier th theory proposes that Ions enter an outer space in the root by diffusion. So there is a carrier energized by plant metabolism which picks up the ion and carries it to the inner space of the roots. And after depositing the ion in the inner space, the carrier is ready to repeat the process. So marine carrier, tagadala. So the first space of the process is called passive uptake and the second uptake Second step requires energy is the active uptake. The ions or group of ions have specific carriers. Merong messenger, merong tagadala. Parang uso ngayon guys, yung grab. Di ba nag-order ka ng pagkain? So kahit nag-order ka pa ng pagkain, kahit maraming mga present siya ng mga catering services, catering restaurant, and you order it, and then, if walang magdadala, you can still not avail of your food that you ordered. So, dapat meron talagang transporter. So, those are called carriers. So, merong mga carriers. And those carriers are the one nagbibit-bit ng mga ions papunta dun sa inner space ng roots. So, from the soil, may tagadala, tagabit-bit. At dinadala yun yung nutrients na yun dun sa inner space ng roots. So, ions or group of ions have specific carriers. Hence, certain plant types such as sugarcane, root crabs, all crabs, and others absorb more potassium than other cations. These are the mechanism of iron adsorption by plants. So we have mass flow, diffusion, contact exchange, or root interception. Mass flow happens uh, through 
the nutrients are carried by mass movement of water as water is absorbed by roots. Diffusion is a movement of ions from a zone of high concentration to a zone of low concentration. And number three is contact exchange or the root interception where there is a direct exchange of ions between the roots and soil colloids as roots come in contact with the soil colloid. But mostly, contact exchange is less. It doesn't happen that much. Most of the time, mass flow and diffusion happens most of the time. So you see, water is very, very important because it makes the transport of minerals and nutrients to plants easier. In mass flow, the amount of nutrients absorbed by the plant depends on the amount and rate of water flow to the roots and the concentration of nutrients in the water. Mass flow is a major avenue by which plants absorb calcium, magnesium, zinc, copper, boron, and iron. And as nutrients are absorbed by plants, concentration in the nutrients vicinity decreases and creates a concentration gradient causing diffusion of solutes towards the roots. What is the response of plants to increasing level of soil nutrients? Plant growth increases when the supply and availability of nutrients are being increased, but the increase or response in growth or yield of the plant is not proportional for every increase in nutrient level over a period of time, which is linear behavior. The development of plant is an exponential or quadratic behavior in which, with increasing level of nutrients, the rate of growth is initially rapid, then it slows down, then finally levels off, which is can be seen in the sigmoid curve. So what is the sigmoid curve? This is a sigmoid curve of system-specific nutrient response curve. So we have here in the x-axis, we have here the nutrient intake. And in the y-axis is the response or the benefit or the growth of the plant. So you can see here in the intake, pag, pag you add nutrient to the plants, in the beginning, pukunti pa lang yung kanyang change. But then as you keep on adding nutrients, you will see there a initial rapid growth of the plants when you increase the rate of nutrients that you apply to the soil. But then will reach a level in which it finally levels off. So yan, kahit pa magdagdag ka pa ng magdagdag dyan ng abono, kahit pa already re reach its peak and adding those nutrients can no longer have any effect. So mag steady na lang siya. So there is no need for you to apply too much, ap apply a fertilizer because hindi na magre-respond yung tanim na yon for that application. So the growth curve is expressed by Mitchell Lake equation and modified by Bray, in which the maximum yield is dictated by the genetic potential of the plant and assumes that other growth factors such as sunlight, moisture, and other factors are at optimum. So kahit pag gaano pa kadami or gaano pa kadami yung inyong ilagay na mga nutrients dyan, pag na-reach na yung maximum na yun, hindi na rin siya magre -react. So, useless lang. So, you just have to find the optimum level of nutrients, the optimum level of conditions in which the plants can maximize its potential. There are factors affecting the uptake of nutrient by plants. So, we have soil factors and plant factors. For the soil factors, number one is oxygen supply. Kasi, plants need oxygen. So, pag ang lupa natin ay saturated with water, it's not good because walang oxygen available sa lupa. Poor aeration of the soil, pag masyadong compacted yung lupa, would inhibit nutrient uptake. Lack of oxygen affects the oxidation state and the availability of some nutrients, particularly iron, manganese, sulfur, and nitrogen. The second is the nutrient concentration in the soil. The higher the concentration of the soil, the greater would be up uptake by the plants. But there should be it should be in a proper balance as it would affect the availability of some nutrients. Remember, I told you about the antagonistic and the synergistic effect of the elements. An excess of some nutrients like boron, aluminum, or other heavy metals 
could be toxic and could interfere with plant metabolism, thereby affecting plant uptake. And the calcium and phosphorus and magnesium and potassium has antagonistic effects. So for example, if you have a lot of magnesium, the potassium will not be available to plants. So meron siya mga antagonistic effect. And then the third factor is soil moisture. Soil moisture is very, very important. The higher the soil moisture, but not at saturation, remember, hindi siya yung water lag yung area mo or saturated yung lupa, the greater the uptake. Moisture affects diffusion and mass flow of nutrients into the roots as well as the dissolution of nutrients. Madi-dissolve yung fertilizer, yung nutrients mo. So it will now be available to plants. And phosphorus compounds which have very low solubility and mobility if the soil is dry. So magiging useless na yung abono na ina-apply nyo pag masyadong mainit at dry yung lupa. The number four factor is soil temperature. It, although it has an indirect effect, the higher the temperature, the greater the root metabolism, hence the greater the absorption of nutrients. Then we have the plant factors, which is the root density and distribution. Roots, yung ugat. In Cebuano, is that gamot. These are very, very important because the roots are uh, play a very important role because they are the one absorbing those water and those elements in the soil. The denser and more widely distributed the plant roots, the greater the nutrient absorption. Phosphorus is very important to supply the plants at early stage to stimulate root proliferation and accelerate the nutrient absorption. High nitrogen and phosphorus supply in the soil enhances root development. So pag healthy yung root system ng, loop, ng tanim, then the tendency is that it can absorb a lot of water and nutrients from the soil. So how we determine the soil fertility status and crop nutrient requirements? In general, available nutrient supply of most soils is adequate to support the requirements of crops. But through time, it becomes depleted. Siyempre, every, every day tayo nag-harvest, every... Nauubos yung available nutrients sa lupa. And it is not anymore enough due to crop removal. Nag-harvest tayo ng mga tanim. Every time we eat some bananas, we eat some pet chai from the plants, we are also taking a lot of nutrients from the plants. And those plants are taking nutrients from the soil. Second is leaching losses. Like leaching. Volatilization, especially for nitrogen fertilizer. Erosion of topsoil, which contains a lot of nutrients. Fixation by clays. And immobilization into organic complexes. So with that, application of fertilizers is necessary to supplement the supply of nutrients so that we can still continue growing our crops. The amount of fertilizer that should be added may be determined by one or a combination of soil analysis, field fertilizer experiment, plant tissue analysis, greenhouse tests, and evaluation of symptoms of nutrient deficiencies. So marami mga ways for you to be able to evaluate the fertility status of your area and the crop nutrient requirement. First is soil analysis. What is soil analysis? That is a relatively rapid method of determining the fertilizer need of the crops by taking soil samples properly. Chemical analysis and interpretation of analytical, analytical results and this include the determination of the pH, organic matter content, available phosphorus, exchangeable potassium, and lime requirement. Soil tests are compared with known values of deficiency or sufficiency, which are derived from previously calibrated data or correlations between the soil test and field fertilizer experiment. So those is one procedure, soil analysis. How do we conduct uh, soil analysis? First, we need to do soil sampling so that we can get a sample from the field. So first, 
the farm for soil fertility evaluation is first delineated in a rough one. Gumawa ka muna ng mapa. Ay, saan ka ba magsasample ng soil? So, you separate the area. So, kung iba yung topography niya, kung masyo hilly or flat or masyo patubig. So, you have to differentiate it. And you group them similar areas similar areas in terms of visible soil properties and management like texture, topography, productivity, level, drainage condition, crops that is being grown or others. And then, the samples are taken randomly all over the sampling area using an ogre, shovel, or spade. So, you will take samples randomly, hindi lang sa isang area, otherwise your result will be biased. If shallow rooted plants are to be planted, you can take sample from the first 30 centimeter. Pag medyo ma ma deep yung tanim na itatanim mo, then it's suggested to do samples 30 to 60 centimeter deep. And then, you take a sample from different borings. So, maraming, maraming borings, marami kang nadidig. And these are mixed in a container that will represent one composite samples and your samples should be labeled so that you know saan mo siya kinuha at kung kailan mo siya kinuha. Otherwise, if you have a lot of samples, you can no longer know saan ba dito ang, alin ba dito ang sa area na to. So, it has to be properly labeled. Second is field fertilizer experiments. Biological tests. This is usually done to determine the optimum amount of fertilizer for a particularly particular crop consisting of treatment plants starting from zero and increasing at regular increments. So, when I was doing when I was working in Lapandai, we have a lot of uh, field trials. So we we tested different rates of nitrogen or potassium. So we begin at zero or it depends upon you. So we have mga treatment plants and then. Uh, you will evaluate what is the response of the plants to those treatments. And then through that result, you can have um, an idea at this particular soil, the optimum growth or productivity of this crop is good with this rate of fertilizer. And then we also have greenhouse experiment. These are primarily exploratory or preliminary approach to determine what nutrients are sufficient in specific soils can be used to estimate the amount of fertilizer nutrients that should be applied because of highly artificial conditions under which it is being conducted. And then second is the volume of the soil explored in a pot by plant roots is limited by the size of the pot in greenhouse experiments. Kasi kukunti lang yung mga uh, Controlled yung condition mo, and then kukunti lang yung mga soil na nasa pot. Its advantages include that several kinds of soil can be tested simultaneously under similar conditions, and that it is cheaper to establish and maintain. So, marami kang pwede maikandak, at saka maraming hand, kasi controlled mo yung area, and then you can simulate the condition of your field. Number four is plant analysis. It measures the amount of nutrients that are absorbed by the plants and integrates the effect of soil, plant, climate, and management variables. However, the sampling of the plant parts to be analyzed, time of sampling, and sample preparation must be given due attention. So, dapat tama yung parts na kinuhanan mo ng sample. Plant parts to be sampled for different crops vary and it depends on the type and age of the crop tissue. Five is the observation of nutrient deficiency and toxicity symptoms. And this is used to assess the need of plants for nutrients occurrence of nutrient deficiency due to insufficient amount and supply of soil nutrients and availability of forms of the nutrients present, no proper balance among the different nutrients. And this is method is usually complemented pinagsama siya by plant analysis and or by soil analysis. Then we also have the soil test kit, which is uh, handy, mas mura siya, mas mabilis yung kanyang result. That 
results in qualitative interpretation of the relative amount of nutrients. So, hindi siya quantitative, qualitative, guys. So, you will just have an idea whether your soil is good or not good, fertile or not fertile. So, it is developed by Department of Soil Science and University of the Philippines at Los Manos, Laguna. And it involves the use of specialized chemicals and dyes, wherein the intensity of color develop is referred to as correlated correlate, cor color chart that interprets the relative condition of soil reaction and amounts of N, P, K, and lime requirement. And it has an acceptable precision results to the results of soil testing in the laboratories. So you just, meron ka makukuha dyan ng mga drops. And then we you also have the vials, the test tubes. And then you put your sample there. Meron siyang... Um, uh, procedure guys so you will just follow the procedure and then you will compare the result of your soil through with the different colors so you can just compare them so it is qualitative uh, uh, result but then the result is precise kinumpara siya dun sa soil testing in the laboratory so if you are far from any laboratory center then the soil test kit is a very very handy uh, tool so that you can evaluate your area. Then we also have the leaf color chart from Iri in Los Banos Laguna. So this is leaf color chart is developed by Iri, but then this leaf color chart is only intended for rice. You cannot use them for corn or banana or others because the colors that are available here is intended for rice. So it is a handy plastic ruler with strips of four shades of green to simulate the color of rice leaves under field condition. This is cheap, fast, and handy field instrument to help farmers visually assess the nitrogen status of the rice plant. So kung kulang or tama lang yung nitrogen status ng yung rice field. So this is a very handy so that you can have an idea whether kailangan mo bang magdagdag ng abono ng nitrogen or hindi. Then we also have the microbiological method which used for approximating the degree of deficiency of elements using the growth of the test organism as an indicator. So we have two kinds here. We have the Acetobacter plaque method and the Aspergillus nigger method. In the Acetobacter plaque method, the method is good for phosphorus, potassium, and calcium. The organism is grown in a culture medium in which all essential elements are provided except that being tested. So the colony growth will increase with the in increase in the amount of nutrients being tested and the growth of colonies in the soil being tested is compared with standards to determine the degree of deficiency. So they will grow there the acidopactor. The second method of microbiological method is the Aspergillus niger method. The fungus produces black spores, which can be used to assay for potassium, magnesium, zinc, and copper deficiency. So the weight of pad, the mycelia, yung mga may itim, that it produces in a given soil can be related to the amount of nutrient present by using standard soils. Soils with no levels for comparison. So, compare siya. We already discussed the different methods of soil fertility evaluation. For example, you, you want to develop an area, you visited an area for an evaluation, and you wanted to titingnan mo kung this area is okay for plants or kung ano yung gusto mo itanim. The first thing that you have to look without doing any test, without doing any soil sampling or anything, you go to the area, you observe the field that you are going to develop. Check. Are the plants present there? Are they all healthy? If you see that even kogon cannot grow, or walang mga kahoy na tumutubo, or kahit mga damo-damo, or kahit mga any, Wala kang makita. It means to say that there is a problem with your soil. It can be fertility or it can be matubig, mabato, 
or any other problem. Those uh, procedure can give you an idea how to directly evaluate the area. Tingnan mo lang yung vegetation, tingnan mo lang kung ano yung mga nakapalibot dun sa area na yun. And it will help you understand the possible problem or the possible limiting factor that can affect the fertility or the productivity of your area. So I hope that can help. And there are also other factors in formulating fertilizer recommendation. Number one is the season of the year. Generally, crop require higher rates of fertilizer during dry season than wet season because there is greater solar energy level or available, there are more vigorous plant metabolism, and therefore there is a high demand of nutrients during dry season. Very active siya. Active yung tanim kasi there's a lot of potential for photosynthesis. Second is the economic value of the crop. Higher fertilizer rates and costs may be justified for high-value crops. Mahal masyado ang abono ngayon, guys. So for low-value crops, the value of returns at high fertilizer rate may not offset the cost. Thus, the value of crop yield must always be pitted against the fertilizer cost. High yield of crops do not always mean high economic return. Pwedeng you can get a lot of yield, Pero you applied too much fertilizer to get that yield. And kung susumahin mo ngayon kung magkano yung nagastos mo kumpara dun sa nakita mo because maybe that plant is, kung ibebenta mo siya, hindi siya ganun ka mahal. Maybe nalugi ka pa or maybe just break even. So you have to consider the economic value of the crop. Number three is nutrient preference of particular type of crops. Different crops have different demands for nutrients. So grain crop demands high for nitrogen, legumes for P, and sugar, fiber, tuber, and all crops for potassium. These are considered in the interpretation of salt test. And sufficiency level of a nutrient for a certain crop may not be a sufficient level for another crop because each crop has its own different nutrient requirements. So yung for example, if you are growing banana and you have a general recommendation of this nutrient, it may not be applicable to growing of rice or growing of corn because corn and banana has different nutrient requirement. So it has to be specific to the crop that you are going to grow. And if you want to learn more, there's a Philippine recommend. So you can always find them in, I think, a national bookstore or in PICAR, they publish a lot of uh, Philippine recommends, which is specific for a particular crop. Then, of course, the soil pH. We discussed them, and it affects the behavior and availability of applied nutrients. Acidic soils have greater P-fixing ability, and therefore, potassium phosphorus fertilizer application must consider the proportion of phosphorus that will be immobilized in the soil. Number five is soil moisture conditions. Moisture does not only affect the solubility of applied fertilizers, but also the activity of the microorganisms. Under limited availability of moisture, lower fertilizers must be used. And since microbial activity, particularly those relating to mineralization of nutrients, is inhibited, less native supply of nutrient is expected. And what happened to the fertilizers? So we have different processes. So we have volatilization. This is a process by which nitrogen fertilizers such as ammonium nitrate or ammonium sulfate, when applied to the surface of alkaline or calcareous soils, changes immediately to gaseous forms, which may cause the loss of nitrogen as um, gas, ammonia gas. Similar reaction can occur in recently lime soil. So that's why when you just applied lime, then you have to wait to, for you to apply uh, nitrogen fertilizers. Or you can first apply nitrogen fertilizers, then apply lime. Volatilization losses can be high under some high temperature and certain moisture conditions. Urea, for example, when applied in the soil, 
converts rapidly to ammonia or ammonium with adequate moisture, temperature, and the presence of urease, which is an enzyme. This ammonia can be lost to the atmosphere through volatilization. To avoid losses, incorporate urea when temperatures are low, para hindi siya mabilis na mag-volatilize, sumingaw, or apply when there is sufficient moisture in the soil so that it will be immediately transported to the roots of the plants. Then we also have denitrification. This is a bio biochemical reduction of nitrate or nitrite to gaseous nitrous oxide and lost to the atmosphere. The dinitrogen gas is the ultimate end product of denitrification, but other intermediate gaseous forms of nitrogen exist. Some of these gases, such as nitrous oxide, which are can be found in the emission of uh, gas from the vehicles, factories, and others, considered greenhouse gases reacting with ozone and contributing to air pollution. Then we also have leaching, which refers to the downward movement of free water percolation out of the root zone, carrying the nutrients in the soil. Nitrates are highly mobile in the soil and move freely with soil water. Most of these nitrates leach through the soil profile, especially on deep sandy soils, than on fine textured soils with moderate drainage and high rainfall. Little phosphorus is lost by leaching, though it moves freely in sandy soils than in clay soils, and part of potassium can be leached in very sandy or organic soils. And ions, which are negatively charged ions, easily lost from the soil following heavy rains. Remember, the soil colloids is negatively charged, and anions are negatively charged, so it doesn't attract, guys, so it repels. So, masya, kaya siya masyadong mabilis na maglilich down. Those negatively charged ions. Then, we also have fixation, in which um, the available plant nutrients are rendered unavailable by reaction with soil components. And generally, this refers to reactions of phosphorus, ammonium, and potassium, leading to decreased availability. Then, we also have erosion, which is the wearing or removal of land surface and other nutrients present in the soil by running water and other geologic agents. And of course, the crop removal. Harvested crops remove much nitrogen and potassium from the soil, and this depends on the kind and quantity of crop. Although crop removal is not usually considered a loss, in reality, it is. The net effect of crop removal is lower soil nitrogen and potassium level, hence application of fertilizers is necessary to maintain nutrient levels. You see, this is a one bunch of a banana, Cavendish banana. So one bunch of banana takes a lot of nutrients from the soil. And when we eat those banana, we eat a lot of banana contains a lot of potassium. And yeah, so it's logical, guys, huh? We take the fruit, we eat them, then we need also to replace what is taken up by the plants and we put it back again to the soil. So we discussed the different kind uh, fates of fertilizers. Now we discuss about fertilizers and its use. Ano nga ba ang abono or fertilizers? These are either organic or inorganic compounds that are added to the soil to supply the plants with nutrient elements that the soil is incapable of supplying. We have two kinds of fertilizer. We have the organic fertilizers and inorganic fertilizers. Organic fertilizers are fertilizers derived from plants and or animals. Inorganic fertilizers are fertilizers derived from mineral deposits, atmospheric gases, water, and other materials, and they have high nutrient contents that is expressed in percent nitrogen, percent P2O5, and percent potassium oxide, K2O. Then we all ha also have fertilizer grade or analysis. This is the minimum guarantee of the plant nutrient content in terms of percentage total nitrogen, 
available phosphorus and water soluble potassium you can always find them in the bag of the fertilizer so for example here we have 14 14 14 so that is the fertilizer grade or 21 ammonium sulfate so if ammonium sulfate has an analysis of 21 percent nitrogen it means that for every 100 kilogram of ammonium sulfate there is 21 kilogram of available nitrogen because not all of that are nitrogen eh? so may mga fillers dyan na nilagay so it only contains 21 percent nitrogen conventional labeling of fertilizer products reports percentage n p2o5 and potassium oxide thus a fertilizer packages as 14 14 14 contains 14% nitrogen, 14% P2O5, and 14% potassium oxide. And it actually contains 14% nitrogen, only 6% phosphorus, and 12% potassium. So we have here different kinds of uh, fertilizers. So we have single nutrient, meaning it only contains one nutrient, like ammonium sulfate. Oh, it also contains sulfur, 24, 20, yeah. So, 21, 0, 0, 24, so 24 is sulfur. Then we have urea, 46, 45% N. Superphosphate, 0, 20, 0. Morate of potash is 0, 0, 60. Then we have compound fertilizers, meaning it contains other fertilizers, other nutrients. So, we have ammonium phosphate, which contains 16% nitrogen, 20% P2O5, diammonium phosphate or DAP, 18460. Complete fertilizers, it's different, guys. So we have 14, 14, 14, 6, 9, 15, or 19, 19, 19. So there's a lot. There are also conventional grades. Uh, these are solid or liquid fertilizers that are highly soluble, proven effective for specified specific crops by field experiments for at least two years and have full registration with Fertilizer and Pesticide Authority. And we also have new grades. These are locally formulated or imported fertilizers with no previous registration with IFPA. And we also have specialty grades, which are finished recommended products to overcome a specific problem or supply the nutrient needed of a specific ornamental indoor plant Long grasses are for other purposes than food, fiber, feed, or other industrial crops. Then we also have organic fertilizers. These are produced from animal manure and crop residues. They are low, they have low nutrient composition. Mababa yung kanyang uh, mineral composition, nutrient, bulky. So, ibig sabihin, since mababa nga siya, you need a lot of pounds, kilos, for you to be able to supply the nutrient requirement needed by the crop but it improves the physical chemical and the microbiological status of the soil the standard weight is 50 kilo and the moisture content should not be below 35 percent and it should not be it should not be stinky it should it should not have any foul odor di ganun kabaho guys otherwise there's a problem mahihirapan kang maghanap ng tao na mag apply ng organic fertilizer na sobrang mabaho, masyadong maalis sa masangsang yung amoy. So, mahihirapan ang mga tao. Then, we also have classification of organic fertilizer. We have pure organic fertilizer and we have fortified or enriched organic fertilizer. Pure organic fertilizer are, contains decomposing activators, but no chemical nor inorganic fertilizer has been added. The fortified or enriched organic fertilizers, they are enriched with microbial inoculants, hormones, and or chemical additives to increase its nutrient content. So these are different kinds of inorganic fertilizers commonly used in plantation crops. And then these are also uh, fertilizers, organic fertilizers commonly used in most by the farmers and most in the plantation crops and this is how we calculate the fertilizer requirement so the weight of fertilizer material is equal to the recommended rate 
over the nutrient content of the material. So saan natin makukuha yung nutrient content of the material? We get them from the grid of the fertilizer. Yung makikita natin sa mga bags ng abono. So we have here different kinds of fertilizer. Urea, complete, ammonium sulfate, ammonium phosphate. So we have different. And this is also the nutrient analysis. So we have N, P2O5, and potassium oxide. So we have urea 4600, but it only contains 45% nitrogen. Complete is around 14, 14, 14, but it only contains 0.14 nitrogen, 0.06P, and 0.12 potassium. Ammonium sulfate is 0.21% N, and the rest. Okay? We are going to need them for us to be able to calculate. So I will show you. Suppose the annual recommendation for a banana is 300-0-500 kilogram potassium and nitrogen, nitrogen and potassium. Compute the amount of fertilizer that you will apply per month, per plant, period, or per month, per application using urea, which contains 45% nitrogen as the source of nitrogen, and muriate of potash, which contains 50% potassium as the source of potassium, assuming that the population of one hectare is 1,900 mats or plants per hectare. So to calculate this, following the formula here, see, weight of fertilizer material is equal to recommended rate divided by the nutrient content of the material, so since meron tayong recommendation na 300 kg of nitrogen, so we need to divide by 0.45. So ibig sabihin, we need, if we divided by 300 divided by 0.45, we need, we have there 667 kg of urea per hectare per year. Okay? And since meron na tayong per hectare per year, na kilo ng urea, meron tayong 1,900 na saging, puno ng saging na nasa isang area, nasa isang hektarya. So we are going to divide it. So it means to say that we need to apply 0.35 kilogram of urea per plant per year. And then since meron tayong 13 periods or 26 um, days per period, so kung every month ka nag apply ng urea, you just divide it by 12 months. If you have periodic in the plantation, we, up, we use period. We have 13 periods per year. So it means to say that we just divide the 0.35 divided by 13 periods. So meaning we need to apply 27 grams of urea per plant per period. If it's per month, then you just have to divide it by 12 months per year. And then what about the potassium? So we have potassium, it's the same. So we have 500 kilogram potassium divided by 0.5. So we have 1,000 kilogram more rate of potash per year, per hectare per year. And then you divide that by the plants per hectare. So we have here 0.526 kilogram per more rate of potash per plant per year. And if you want to apply also every month, then you can just divide it by 13 periods, or para mas makatipid ka sa abono, labor cost, you can apply it every two months, then you will calculate the amount that you are going to give to your plant per application. So remember that the morate of potash, the grade is 0, 0, 0060, but the potassium content is only approximately 50%. So I hope this is clear to you guys. If you have a question, please let me know. And then, so based from the above example, you will apply 27 gram of urea per tree per application, which is every periodic, and 40 gram of morate of potash per plant per application, which is also periodic, and always based the computation on the actual population of the area, since the recommendation is on per hectare basis. Then I have here another ex uh, example. 
Determine how many bags of ammonium sulfate, which contains 21% nitrogen, 00, 0 P, and the potassium, will be needed to satisfy the fertilizer recommendation of 90-0-0. Each bag weighs 50 kilo. So following the recomm uh, formula, recommended rate divided by the nutrient content of the material. So we just divide 90, which is the nitrogen, divided by 0.21. And that is 428.57 kilogram ammonium sulfate per hectare. And to calculate the bag, the number of bags that we need to buy, so you just divide it by 50 kilogram bag. So for one hectare of uh, area, then you need around 8.57 bags of ammonium sulfate to satisfy the recommendation of 90.00. And then you just divide it kung gaano kadami yung tanimo so that you will know how much fertilizer, how much ammonium sulfate will you need to apply per plant. The second example is determine how much ammonium sulfate and ammonium phosphate that will be needed to satisfy the fertilizer recommendation of 90-30-0. So, medyo complicated na tong question na to guys. So, kita mo meron kang dalawang source ng abuno. One fertilizer contains only nitrogen and the other fertilizer ammonium phosphate contains both nitrogen and the phosphorus and you need to satisfy the fertilizer recommendation of 90 nitrogen and 30 kilogram pto5 so in this example identify first the fertilizer that contains two elements so dun ka mag una mong ikakalculate Hanapin mo muna yung abono na co-contain ng dalawang klase ng nutrients. So for in this case, um, we have ammonium phosphate which contains both nitrogen and phosphorus. So ammonium phosphate is a source of nitrogen and P2O5 which is 16% nitrogen and 20% P2O5. And then consider first the lowest recommendation. So, dyan, meron tayong 90-30. So, 30 muna yung ikakalculate natin. Since it contains only 30 kilos of P2O5, calculate first the P2O5. So, using the formula, recommended rate divided by the nutrient content of the material. So, we use 30 kilo divided by 0.2, which is equal to 150 kilogram of ammonium phosphate. But then, since ammonium phosphate contains both 16% nitrogen and 20% P2O5, when you apply 150 kg of ammonium phosphate, you were able to supply 24 kg of nitrogen and 30 kg of P2O5. Correct? So, saan natin nakuha yung 24 kg nitrogen? 150 times 0 0.16, so you have 24, and 150 times 20%, you have 30 kilogram. So, meaning to say, when you apply 150 kilogram of ammonium phosphate, we are able to meet the 30 kilogram requirement of phosphorus, and at the same time, we were able to meet 24 kilogram of nitrogen. So, sa out of 90 na kailangan natin, ima-minus na lang natin ngayon yung 24 kilo, yun na lang yung isasatisfy natin using ammonium sulfate. So now, um, with that, so with application of 150 kilogram ammonium phosphate, the recommendation of 90-30-0 becomes, yun, ibabawas na lang natin ngayon. So 90-30-0 minus 24-30-0. So since nasatisfy na natin yung phosphorus, then we only need to calculate 66% of nitrogen using ammonium sulfate. So 66% kilogram of nitrogen divided by 0.21, then we only need to apply... 314.29 kilogram of ammonium sulfate. So you apply 150 kilogram of ammonium phosphate plus 314.29 kilogram of ammonium sulfate, then you were able to meet the fertilizer recommendation of 90-30-0. The use of fertilizers, I hope it's clear to you guys. Let me know kung meron kayong question. 
The use of fertilizers is based on basic principles of plant nutrition, properties of the soil, environmental conditions, target yield, and other considerations. There are different methods of fertilizer application. Number one is broadcast, in which the fertilizer is spread uniformly over the surface of the soil before planting and uh, suitable where crops are grown, closely growing, such that roots covers. And broadcasting of fertilizers when leaves are wet is not recommended as it may cause burning injury. Top dressing is also used uh, and applied uh, on crop after emergence. Then we have localized. We have two methods here, side dressing and in the row. Side dressing is you apply the fertilizer along the side of seed or plant. And in the row, we have apply in uh, along the bottom of the furrow, slightly covered with soil, and then seeds are planted. Then we also have ring application in which the fertilizers are applied in band around trees, in shallow trench, then covered slightly with soil. And the distance from the base depends on the type of crop and age. For most tree crops, we normally consider the canopy of the plants. So, kunin muna natin yung kung saan yung pinakalas na, yan, sa picture na yan, yung leaves, then that is the canopy cover, then you have to get the maximum of that. Why? Because most of the root system, the active root system, are spread dun sa canopy, edge ng canopy. Then we also have whole trench perforation application wherein the fertilizers are dropped in holes or around trees. Then we have localized. These are seed pelleting done by coating the seeds with the fertilizers by means of adhesives. And we also have seedling dipping. Uh, uh, this is usually done for micronutrients wherein seedlings are dipped into fertilizer solution to enhance the survival ability of seedlings and lessen the effects of transplanting shock. Then we also have foliar application involves dissolving of solid fertilizer materials in water and applying it as a spray to the plant or direct application of liquid fertilizers as foliar spray. And it provides um, rapid utilization of nutrient by plants where soil has a high fixing capacity for the nutrient. This is usually done for commercial pineapple, and banana plantation. However, there is a risk of leaf burning for nitrogen fertilizers when too high concentrations are used, and it is not suitable for grain crops and other crops with small or narrow leaves, and this is suitable for applying nutrients since the small dosage needed can be applied uniformly with water serving as carrier, and since most of the micronutrients are easily fixed in the soils, unless a suitable chelate is used, such as zinc, manganese, iron, are more efficiently used up by plants when it is applied as sprays. And this is also made at more frequent interval, particularly for ants, since high solution concentration can burn the leaves. It is popular for ornamental, particularly orchids, and it is suitable when deficiency is detected early and quick remedy is desired. And foliar sprays can be mixed with insecticide fungicides, so it is cheaper since two operations can be accomplished at one time. And then we have the timing of fertilizer application. It depends on climate, soil, nutrient, and crop in sandy soils, and is necessarily split as well as potassium. For heavy clays, all of the nitrogen is sometimes placed at planting. The phosphorus and potassium are usually applied at planting as they are less mobile, less subject to leaching, and less soluble. Phosphorus is also needed at a young age to accelerate root development. That's why it's necessary to apply um, roots when the plant is still very, very young because it helps in their root development. And in alkaline soils, ammonium fertilizer is necessary deep place to minimize volatilization of ammonia. There are different causes of soil fertility decline. All soils which are originally fertile can lose this characteristic because of improper soil and nutrient management. And this can be lost through number one, crop removal, leaching, volatilization, immobilization, salinity, 
soil erosion, acidification, fixation, and denitrification. And these are the recommended soil fertility and management practices. So first, you have to fertilize. It can be whatever, inorganic or organic. And the, integrate, the use of integrated nutrient management or INM through organic matter maintenance, crop rotation, crop, crop cover cropping, property ledge, cropping patterns, and system. Of course, we can maintain the organic matter by applying green manure or organic residues or the use of poultry manure or waste, farm waste, and crop protection, crop rotation because uh, high nutrient crops are rotated with low nutrient crops so that uh, ma balance mo ngayon yung loop, nutrients na nasa lupa. It will not be fast, uh, fastly depleted. And also the maintenance of vegetative cover like to reduce erosion, prevent leaching of nitrogen, potassium, and possibly other elements. It improves soil structure, it stores organic matter in the soil, becomes fire hazard during prolonged dry season and it's also become a breeding place for pests so that's why you need to also consider property lage so that you minimize compaction cropping pattern you intercrop depending upon your area relay or sequential cropping and again the use of organic fertilizers I think that's all guys. So, ito na yung last na presentation natin for this lecture series. I hope you've learned something from all the lecture videos and I wish you all success and thank you very much for supporting my channel and let me know kung meron kayong hindi na intindihan. I will try my best and sana makahabol pa to sa inyong preparation. Again, thank you very much and success on your exam. Bye!